on the left, the Venus is reacting with the oxygen in the air. It's an oxidation reaction. Okay. What is this? Can we tell the answer? It's a chemical reaction. What type of a reaction? What does it look like? What, what's what's happening? The chain is rusty. And so if something rusts, what's it reacting? Oxygen. Oxygen in the air. And so in both cases, the thing, whatever it is, is reacting with oxygen in the air. But what is very, very different about these two reactions? The, the reaction rate. Burning goes very, very fast. Rust forms very, very slowly. So you have two reactions that are essentially identical. They're both something reacting with oxygen in the air. But one happens very, very fast, while the other happens slowly. So we have to learn why that is. What determines whether something reacts fast or slow? We call that the reaction rate. It's just a measure of how fast that reaction is happening. Okay? We're not going to calculate reaction rates, but if you were to describe a reaction rate, you would use the unit of moles per second. So that's just telling you how many moles of reactant are getting reacted every second. Okay? There are a number of things that determine how fast something reacts. First is temperature. Probably the most obvious one, the one that you immediately knew, things that are hotter react faster. If you're in a lab and your reaction is going slow and you want it to go faster, what can you do? Heat it up. Hot things react faster. You can also increase reactant concentration. Okay? We'll see why that increases rate in a few slides, but this also kind of makes sense. If you take two solutions that are very dilute and you mix them together, you're not going to form product very quickly. But if you take two solutions that are very, very concentrated and you pour them together, you're going to make product really fast. Imagine you're in a lab and you have a beaker of acid and a beaker of base that you know if they react together, something bad could happen. Which two do you want to pour together while you're standing next to them? The ones that are dilute or the ones that are very, very concentrated? Dilute. dilute. You can pour them together, and yes, what they make may be dangerous, but you're not going to make very much very fast. If you pour two concentrated things together, it's going to happen very, very quickly. And we can also increase surface area. Remember when we were talking about what determines how quickly something dissolves in water, we said surface area will affect that. The more surface area you have, the quicker that sugar is going to dissolve, because for the sugar to dissolve, it has to be touching the water. If you have more surface area, more sugar is touching the water, so more is dissolving at the same time. If you have a sugar cube, only the outside of that cube is touching the water, so only the outside of the cube is dissolving. This is basically the same exact thing. Imagine you've dropped a sugar cube in a beaker of a solution. Instead of dissolving, it was going to react with it. Or if you have a chunk of metal and you drop it in a beaker of another chemical, it's going to react with it. If you have a chunk of metal, only the metal on the outside of that chunk can react. But if you take that metal and you grind it down into dust, and you put that in there, then you have a whole lot more surface area. And there's a lot more surface area touching the liquid around it, and so it's going to react a lot faster. And the fourth thing is presence of a catalyst. This one is the least logical. We'll see what this does later on. But if you add a catalyst to a reaction, it increases how fast that reaction happens. So here we have a reaction. Okay. On the left, we have two flasks, and we have a balloon on top. This reaction is going to create gas as a product. Okay. If we take the two flasks, 
when you just put the balloon on top, there's one reactant here, and the second reactant in there, and you put the balloon on top, this is showing you that there's no gas being given off. But if you mix them, you get gas. And so here, we have two different flasks. In this flask, flask, we mix two solutions that were dilute. In this flask, we mix two solutions that were concentrated. Which one reacted faster? Concentrated. The concentrated one. We made a lot more gas in the same amount of time. The increasing reactant concentration increases reaction rate. This is the effect of surface area on reaction rate. If you pass electricity through steel, it will essentially make it rust a lot quicker. So what this is, is a bottle of oxygen with a nail in it. And then that nail is hooked up to electrical wires so that when you pass electricity through it, it gets really hot. If you heat it up, you cause the reaction to happen fast. But if you take the same apparatus, instead of a nail, you use steel wool. Which one's reacting faster? The steel wool, obviously, right? There's sparks going all over the place. This is just kind of glowing. So increasing the surface area, there's the same amount of iron or steel here as there is there. But over here, we have a lot more surface area. So it all reacts at the same time. Over here, only the iron on the very outside of the nail is reacting. And so you're not getting the kind of sparking in the high reaction rate. This is a catalyst. The use of a catalyst is called catalysis. This is a piece of liver. Liver has in it an enzyme called catalyst. It's a protein. It's a protein. Enzymes are proteins. Enzymes are what in the things in our body that actually do things. If something in your body or in a cell does something, it is a protein called an enzyme. Liver has catalase. Catalase, the purpose of catalase is to break hydrogen peroxide apart. Okay? If you make, if you break hydrogen peroxide apart, you get hydrogen and you get oxygen. Both of those are gases. So if you take a piece of liver, and you put hydrogen peroxide on it, the hydrogen peroxide, when it touches the catalase, it's gonna get split apart, and you get bubbles. If you put the hydrogen peroxide over here, where there is no catalase, it's not gonna break apart. It's just gonna sit there. The catalase acts as a cat catalyst to make the reaction. What really drives these changes in reaction rate, why temperature, surface area, and catalyst change reaction rate, comes down to how we imagine reactions happening. And how we imagine reactions happening on the molecular level is called collision theory. What this says is that for a reaction to happen, two molecules have to collide. So we have two molecules flying around. If they're going to react with each other, they have to hit each other. If one's over here and one's over there, they will never react. The first requirement is that they have to hit each other. When they hit each other, they have to hit with proper orientation. Now imagine I have two molecules. They're both the same type of molecule. One is the molecule is made up of a white atom and a green atom. And they're flying around. And for them to react, the white atom from that molecule has to hit that green atom from that molecule. If you have White hitting white, nothing happens. A white has to hit a green. That's what we mean by proper orientation. If the molecules get this way, they react. If one of them is turned around, or they're both turned around, nothing is going to happen. Also, when they hit, they have to have enough energy. We'll see why, but 
for a reaction to happen, you have to put energy in. You always have to put energy into a reaction to make it happen. The question is then, how much do you get out afterwards? Do you get out more or less than you actually put in? So if these two molecules are gonna hit, they have to hit hard enough to have enough energy to make it react. If they just very slowly bump into each other, they're not going to react. So, if I have two molecules flying around and they need to hit each other hard, that means they need to be flying around quickly. What can we do to make molecules fly around quickly? Yeah. Heat them up. We said temperature was a measure of kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is a measure of how fast something is moving. So when you heat it up, temperature goes up, that means there's more kinetic energy, they're moving faster. That's why heating something up causes it to react faster. It does two things. Not only do they, when they hit, are they hitting hard, but they're flying around faster, so it's more likely that they're gonna hit each other. If they're barely moving, they could fly around a long time without hitting. The faster they're flying around, the more often they're gonna hit. So using collision theory, we're going to come back to our energy diagram. We have already drawn energy diagrams. That's the thing where we had energy and time and exothermic and endothermic reactions. We're going to make them a little bit more complicated now. When you think about an energy diagram, you're going from a reactant, that's where you're starting, to the products where you're ending. But you always have to put energy in to get from your reactants to your products. So think of it this way. If I'm at home and I'm on the couch, I'm in my normal state, and I decide I want ice cream. Ice cream would make me happy. Molecules are happier when they have less energy. Okay? They want to be lazy. Molecules are lazy. They want as little energy as possible. So if I'm on the couch, and I am here, and I want ice cream, I know if I get ice cream, I will be happier, I will be in a lower energy state. But I don't have any ice cream. And so if I wanted to get here, where I'm sitting on the couch eating ice cream, I first have to go to the store. That's the barrier preventing me from eating ice cream on the couch. I have to get up enough energy to get off the couch, go to the store, buy the ice cream, and come home. I'm sitting here thinking, is it worth it? Is it worth going up this hill so that I can come down the other side? Reactions work the same way. When your reactants are sitting there, they are here. In order for them to, to react, they have to have enough energy to hit the top of that peak. Once they're at the top of the peak, they will react. And then, if it's exothermic, they'll drop down here, below where they started. If it's endothermic, they'll just drop down a little bit and end somewhere up here. So this is an energy diagram for an actual reaction. Over here, we have our reactants. We have ozone, O3, and NO. That's what they look like. These are our reactants. We're starting here. We have to go up this hill. At the top of the hill is called the, tra the transition state. So we have the reactants, we have the products, and the transition state. The transition state is literally something in between the reactants and the products. So here, the reactants are ozone and NO, and our products are O2 and NO2. The transition state is just these two things with sort of a temporary half bond holding them together. Okay? A transition state only exists for an infinitesimally small amount of time. It does exist, but because it's in a process of reacting, it's not like you can take it out of your beaker. As soon as it exists, it goes over here. So you can never pull a transition state out of a reaction. 
the jump between your reactions in your transition state is called the activation energy. That's what energy, so the sub A is activation energy. In order for these reactants to get down to these products, they have to get the activation energy. They have to have that much energy in order to get to the top of the roller coaster. They need that chain to take them to the top of the roller coaster, and once they're on the top, then they free fall down. You can't stop it. Once you're up here, it's going to happen. But you have to put in the energy to get them up to the top. If you add a catalyst, it reduces the activation energy. Instead of having one big hill, it turns it into two smaller hills. And so, it's a whole lot easier to get over that hill than it is that hill. And if you get over that hill, you automatically have enough to get over that hill, because the first hill is hotter. And so, in this case, if you're a reactant and you want to get to a product without a catalyst, you need to get way up here. If you add a catalyst to that reaction, that barrier isn't as high. You just need to get to here. That's why a catalyst increases the rate of reaction. More molecules in that beaker will have enough energy to get over that hill than will to get over that hill. And so if you mix two reactants, the molecules in there that have enough energy are going to react. The ones that don't, won't react. And since this one has a lower barrier, more of them are going to have enough to react. Does that make sense? We use catalysts in our cars. You ever heard of the catalytic converter? Yeah. It takes the pollution that comes out of your engine and converts it into things that aren't as harmful. So a catalytic converter has a very thin layer of platinum on it. Platinum is a very good catalyst. So this is our muffler. In the muffler is our platinum. That's this. If we have an oxygen molecule that bonds. And then the carbon monoxide coming from the exhaust will also bond. Oxygen is going to come from the air carbon monoxide coming from the burning gasoline. We don't want to be putting carbon monoxide into the atmosphere. So the oxygen binds here, the carbon monoxide binds here, and essentially what the platinum does is it holds those two molecules next to each other so they have no choice but to react. For them to react, it takes longer and long enough that if they're flying around and they hit each other, they're not going to have enough time. They're just going to bounce off each other and go on their merry ways. But as the platinum holds the oxygen here and the carbon monoxide there, that oxygen sits right next to that carbon for a long time. So then that carbon will grab that oxygen and carbon dioxide will come off the catalytic converter. You still have one oxygen sitting here, but now if another carbon monoxide comes and lands here, it will grab that oxygen and fly away. So you're converting carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. It will also convert nitrogen monoxide to N2 and O2. Carbon monoxide and nitrogen monoxide are bad things. You don't want to be true. So we need to now draw our own energy diagram. Okay. So if we're given a reaction, it says draw the energy diagram, and we need to show the relative energies of the reactants, products, and transition state. We need to label them, and we need to draw molecular representations of the reactants, products, and the transition state, which is also called the activated complex. Okay? This question is a little more complicated than what you would have to do in a quiz or an exam. You would just have to label 
but with the word reactant transition state product. You don't need to label or draw the little molecular representations that we're going to draw. So, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my axis. What unit or what is measured on the y axis? Energy. We've got energy here and it's high energy at the top. What's on the x axis? Time. We've got time, and this is just as time goes on, how much energy do we have? So I need to first draw the reactor. The reactants, you can put anywhere. Okay, we can pick anywhere on here to start. So I'm just gonna start in the middle. That's my reactants. Then I need to draw the line to the transition state. The transition state is always higher than the reactants. The transition state is always the highest point on the graph. So I am going to now draw a little hill. I'm just I don't know how high I need to go, but I know I have to go up. So I'm going to draw a hill going up. Now, the tricky part is where do I draw the products? Because I can draw the products anywhere from here to there. Where do I need to draw the products? How do we know? The, 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 whether it's endothermic or exothermic. So the question tells us it's an endothermic reaction. So there's really two zones it can end up. The reactants are there. The products can either be above that line, below that line, or they could actually be on that line. The fact that it's endothermic is it going to be above, below, or on that line? Above. It's going to be above. Endothermic means that we gain heat. And so it's going to be above that line. Yes, we lost energy compared to the transition state, but we are higher than we started. Endo and exothermic only applies beginning to end. The transition state in both endo and exothermic reactions is the highest point. It is always the highest point. Now we need to draw molecular representations of reactants, products, and the transition state. Reactants and products aren't so bad. I'm going to draw black atoms are nitrogen and white atoms are oxygen. So, our one reactant is NO2. And it says there are two of them, so I'm going to draw two of them. A product is two NOs and an O2. So we need to get from that to that. Remember the transition state is a point in time where the two hit each other. It's a cross between the two. Can anyone visualize, if you have those two atoms, you've got Those two atoms, they need to hit each other so that when they fly back apart, we get that. Can you take these molecules in your mind and twist and turn them so that when they hit, it's possible for them to come apart into those three? So, do you 
you're just turning a 180? Yeah, I think so. So those two hit like that. Is it possible for them to fall apart such that we get those three? Mm -hmm. So we just put them right up on each other, like the N O, the N O O, and then King Tide coming. So you're wanting this to like that? Yeah, yeah that's, that's what right. I that's what I mean. Right. That's what I mean. So in that case, we would have. So you're saying turn the, the two white ones hit the two white ones? And so you've got Then they separate. Yeah. To me, this is the most logical way. But the thing about transition states is because you can't pluck them out, you never know for certain what they are. And so if you can imagine a world where they fall apart to give you what, you, what they need to give you, they are possible. And so that is possible. This is possible. I mean, if, if that these two came off, and those two came off, and then those two went off, that would work. Up here, I don't. This one would not work. Why would this one not work? Too spaced because out. Because they're spaced out, and they um, You need of you. at least two oxygen touching each other. This one doesn't have that. So that one's possible. That one's possible. This one is basically the same thing. It's to 180, so this one's possible. So if you were to ever have to draw a transition state, which unless Wiley does when there's no way to draw a transition state on a website, you don't have to. But if it is possible, it's right. There is no definite correct answer for what a transition state looks like. So what they drew was that. So if I could draw, that's what my stuff would look like. We've got reactants, transition state, products. If I drew a line from here to here, what would you call that? Activation energy. Activation energy. Make sure you know that term also. Mm -hmm. Say it again. Activation. Yeah. So from the line from the reactants, the horizontal line where the reactants are up to the transition state. That hill is the activation energy. Okay. So that is reaction rate. That is our energy diagram. Big topic for today is chemical equilibrium. We very briefly talked about equilibrium before. We talked about vapor pressure. What was the equilibrium of vapor pressure? What, did, what was going on there? We, we had a closed container with liquid in the bottom, and that liquid was evaporating up into the top. What was the equilibrium? It has 
Like when one item is torn up, it's like another one. Perfect. Yes. Equilibrium means there are two things that are opposites of each other, but they're happening at the same rate at the same time. So in our closed container, we had water that was evaporating, but we also had water vapor that was going back into the liquid. They were both happening at the same time continuously. Neither one stopped, but because gas was becoming liquid at the same speed that liquid was becoming gas, the amounts of liquid and the amounts of gas stopped changing. That is equilibrium. Same thing happens with chemical reactions. We like to think of reactions going from beginning to end. When we drew our reactions, we said this plus this yields that plus that. These were reactants. These were products, and when you did your stoichiometry, you said this much reactant will give you this much product. But, like we talked about, with actual yield versus theoretical yield, actual yield is almost always less than your theoretical. Part of that is due to the fact that when you transfer from one beaker to another, you lose stuff. But it's also due to the fact that your reaction, your own reaction almost never finishes. It stops before it gets to the end. It hits equilibrium. So in this container, we have a reaction going on. Okay? We have this molecule with two blues and four reds that falls apart. It just decomposes. When it decomposes, it makes the smaller molecule with one blue and two reds. The molecule with one blue and two reds is yellow or brown in color. So the more of that product that we have, the more yellow or brown our container is. So if we put a bunch of the big molecule in, there's not much color in that. Well, if we just let it sit there, over time, some of these are going to fall apart. We're going to get more and more of these. And so it turns color. We give it some more time, and more fall apart. And it turns into that color. But at that point, if we let it sit longer, it doesn't get any darker. It's just going to sit there. And that's because, yes, these were breaking apart, but if these two fit back together just right, they'll reform that. So after this much time, we hit equilibrium. These are falling apart at the same rate that these two small ones are coming back together to remake the big one. So we are at equilibrium. We have two reactions happening at the same time at the same rate. When we draw this for a chemical reaction, instead of a yield arrow, we have a double arrow. This is telling us that this turning into that, but this is also turning into that. Okay? So if you see that, you may also see it, instead of like that, you may see it a double arrow with just one prong to it, I guess. You may also see it like that. They all mean the same thing. You're putting it there, and there's arrows going in both directions, meaning both reactions are happening at the same time. You can take this and flip it. For this reaction going from left to right, that's your reactant, and that's your product. But it's going the other direction at the same time. And so this is a reactant, and that's a product also. You can flip it. doesn't matter. We can write equilibrium mathematically. That slide looks scary, probably. This is easy. Okay? Don't make it harder than it has to be. This truly is easy. So this is a generic reaction with reactants A and B 
given as products C and D, and then the lowercase letters are the coefficients. So this is a balanced equation with our coefficients here. If we write the value for our equilibrium, we call it the equilibrium constant. And so the equation for it is equilibrium constant expression. The equilibrium constant is KEQ. K generally stands for constant. KEQ is the equilibrium constant. So now what we do is to put the products over the reactants. That's a phrase you want to get stuck in your head. Products over the reactants. When you're doing this homework, just say that phrase over and over again, and it's going to lead you to down the right path. Products over the reactants. So you're always going to have a fraction. It is literally going to be products over the reactants. Products are on top, reactants are on the bottom. When you do this, we're going to put each reactant on the top in brackets, each product, each reactant on the bottom in brackets. So in this case, C and D are our products. You put them in brackets. A and B capitals are our reactants. You put them in brackets on the bottom. And then the coefficients become the exponents and you're done. Okay? That is the equilibrium constant expression. Put the products in brackets on the top with the coefficients and exponents and the same thing for the reactants on the bottom. If they can be switched, how do you know which are products and which are reactants? You would go by how it's written here. And so in this case, as it's written, these are reactants, so they're products. If you flip this, this would flip. Brackets mean concentration. And in this case, the concentration is going to be molarity. So, if you know the concentration of these four things, you're going to plug those into those things, raise them to the exponents to do the math. And you're done. So here's an example. We have the reaction up top. First thing we need to do is write the equilibrium constant expression. So I'm going to draw my line. What goes on top? Products, reactants on the bottom. What are my products? NH3. NH3. I only have one product here. It's NH3. So I'm in brackets, I'm going to write NH3, and what is the exponent? Two. Two. So let's take the coefficient and write it there. On the bottom, we have reactants. What are my two reactants? Nitrogen and hydrogen. N2 and H2. What is the exponent on N2? One. One, and so you don't have to write it if you don't want. And the exponent on H2 is 3. That is the equilibrium constant expression for that reaction. How do we find the exponent? It's the coefficient. So for nitrogen, the coefficient is 1. It's not written. Oh, I'm going to Then we've got a 3. No. Okay. We're not. We're, not. Well, we're coming to that. Oh, we're coming to that. Okay. So that is part A. When you see this on an exam or a quiz, it's going to be two parts. It's going to be one part, part A, write that. You didn't even know what the heck was going on to write that. You put the products over the reactants, and you got it correct. Part B is going to be, what is the value if these are the concentrations? On a quiz or an exam, you're not going to be given a graph that you have to read. You're just going to be flat out told these are the concentrations. You'll plug them in, 
put this in your calculator, you get your answer. When you put it in your calculator, you just treat these like parentheses. That raised to that power, that to that, times that to that. So in this case, we're given these measurements. Okay? We're told the initial concentration. We have nitrogen at this concentration, hydrogen at that concentration. Because they haven't been mixed yet, we, haven't, we don't have any problem. This is irrelevant for us. The numbers we need to plug in are the equilibrium concentrations. These. So all I have to do is read those numbers off and put them into here. So what is the concentration of NH3? Zero. 0 0.280 squared. What is the concentration of nitrogen? 0 0.06. 0 0.06. And the concentration of hydrogen? 0 0.18. If you put that in your calculator, what do you get? This could be an issue with order of operation. Make sure you put it in your calculator correctly. What did you get? 224. Okay, we got 224. Well, we have 224. Did anybody get Make sure with your calculator you know how to put something like that in your, into it. Because it, it looks like that <coughs> divided by that times that. But if you put that in your calculator just like how I said that, you're going to get the wrong answer. Yeah. Okay, so the 0.28 times 28. So the square. Square. Everybody feel confident in their ability to do that? You don't want to do all the hard work and then put it in your calculator wrong. Because on multiple choice, I can't give you a partial correct. If it helps, you can do it one by one. You can do the top first and then once yeah. you get that answer. However you need to do it. Just find what works for you and then do it. Talk about reactions as being reactant favor or product favor. And when we say that, what we're saying is what is larger, the product or the reactant? The top of the fraction or the bottom of the fraction? And this is sort of some simple math in terms of fractions. If you have a fraction, product of reactants, if the top is bigger than the reactant, what can you always say 
about the answer? It's greater than one. It's greater than one. If the top of your fraction is larger than your than your bottom, then your answer will be more than one. What happens if your bottom is larger than your top? It becomes smaller than one. And what happens if they're equal to each other? They're one. And so your equilibrium value will either be less than one, one, or greater than one. And so we said that it is greater than one if the products are larger than the reactants. So if your KEQ is larger than one, that is product favored. If your KEQ is less than one, it is reactant favored. And if it is exactly one, it is neither. KEQ greater than one, that's product favored. KEQ less than one, reactant favored. KEQ one, is neither. This table says lies to the right and lies to the left. That's a term we're going to use in the next few slides. When we say lies to the right, you go look at our reaction. When it says lies to the right, the right is the products. The left is the reactants. Okay? If we say a reaction moves to the right, that means the equilibrium is going to shift towards the products. If we say it shifts to the left, or it moves to the left, that means our equilibrium is moving towards the reactants. So here's another example. We have a reaction, and we're given flat out given our concentration. One, we need to write the expression. Two, we need to find the value. And then three, we need to say whether it's product or reaction phase. So I've got KEQ equals. I draw my line. What's on top of my line? Products, Products in this case, is what? N2O4, I put it in brackets. What is the exponent? One. What is my reactant? NO2 to the second power. The coefficient on NO2 is two. Got that two, comes up there. Now all I have to do is plug those numbers in. I don't even have to read them off the graph. N204 is 1.25 to the 1. And then I've got 0 0.0750 squared. If you do that, what do you get? Favored, product favored, or neither? Product. Products favored. There's a couple ways you can do this. One, you can say that is more than one, and so that's product favored. You can also go back and figure out what these two values are and just say which one is bigger. Is 1.25 larger or smaller than 0.075 squared? And you can literally write the two numbers. See which one's larger, the reactants or the products. Okay. I didn't write a unit there. This is the one case where there is no unit. KEQ has no unit. I think that this is not the one case. This is one of two. We got another case next week. But for K, the value of KEQ has no unit. It is just 222. Is this a limit? Like, a mm, No. 
you, you may be thinking of we're calculating reaction, reaction rate. Reaction rate is sort of a, it's similar to taking a derivative of that, but it's not exactly. Hi, Noah, how, one small. How do we determine which one is famous? You said when the if that number is larger than one, mm -hmm. that means the top of the fraction is bigger, and the top is the product. If that number is less than one, that means the bottom of the fraction is larger, and the bottom is direct. Or you could also go a step back to here and say what's larger, this part or that part. Good. Can do it on a quiz. Do it on a final exam. Yeah. Not too bad. Say it again. Oh, the the, the number on it. Two twenty four. Correct. It, it will give you a reaction and say write the equilibrium expression. Okay. And so there isn't really an equation to remember other than the products of a reaction. Equilibriums don't stay in one place. They change. And changing these equilibriums is called the Chatelier's principle. What we're going to do is we have a reaction at equilibrium. They're all at a given concentration. Our reactants and our products all have their own concentration. Those concentrations are no longer changing. They're sitting there. But we can manipulate that reaction. We can add things. We can take things out. And when we do that, all of a sudden, the reaction is not at equilibrium. If I have my, my reaction, the product of the reactants, and it's at equilibrium, if I increase, if I add, if I add reactants, all of a sudden the bottom of my fraction is larger than it's supposed to be. I'm out of balance. Equilibrium will shift. The reaction will move left or it will move right just so that it gets back to equilibrium. We can use what this guy learned to predict if I do this to this reaction, which direction is the reaction going to move? And we can disrupt our equilibrium by adding or removing a reactant or a product. This is by far the most common thing, the type of reaction, the type of question that you'll see on a quiz or exam. If we're working with gases, we have gases reacting with other gases, we change the volume of the container, we're essentially going to change the concentration. And if you do that, it's going to upset the equilibrium change the temperature, you're also going to change the equilibrium. Okay? But you don't necessarily know which way it's going to go. Okay? Where you can really predict what's going to happen is this top one. So we are going to come back to our generic equation here. A plus B is in equilibrium with C and D. If we add something, I really visualize this. And so if we add something, whether it be a reactant or a product, all of a sudden we have too much of it. And so the reaction is going to shift away from it. If we add a reactant, whether it's A or B, all of a sudden we have too much of this. And so the reaction is going to shift this way. If we add some of that, more of these are going to react together to make those. If I add some of this, all of a sudden the bottom of my fraction is too large. If I take some of my reactants and I make the reaction go to the right, this number on the bottom is going to go down, but at the same time the number on the top is going to go up. Because as the reactants get consumed, products get made. And 
So that is going to happen until I reach that KEQ value again. And then it will stop. So if I add reactive, it will shift to the right. If I add product, if I add C or D, all of a sudden I have too much product. And so it will shift to the left. If I add reactant, shift right. Add product, shift left. You can also remove anything that's in this reaction also. If I remove reactant, I essentially create a hole. I created a void that needs to be filled. This is going to flow back to fill that void. If I pull some of this out, this is going to flow that way to fill the void. You're going to replace what you pull out. Does that make sense? It's kind of like diffusion. Yeah, it, it, it's going to go high concentration to low concentration. If all of a sudden you have more reactant, that also means you don't have enough product. But that's kind of one and the same. And so too much of that, not enough of that, you're going to go that way. And so the type of reaction, type of question you're going to see is, if I add some of that, or add some of that, or remove some of that, remove some of that, which direction is it going to shift? Another way of looking at this is if you have a container, and in that container you have yellow atoms and green atoms, and somehow they can magically go back and forth between yellow and green, and at equilibrium, you want to have five yellows, and then the rest are green. If you were to somehow pull out two of the yellows, all of a sudden you don't have enough yellows. And so a couple of the greens are going to turn yellow to reestablish your equilibrium. You need to remember what the definition of equilibrium is. If we had two reactions going on at the same time, these are becoming that and these are becoming these at the same time. When they reach equilibrium, the reactions don't stop. That's what a lot of students like to say. If I ask what is meant when a reaction is at equilibrium, they'll tell me the reactions have stopped. They have not stopped. It's just that these are becoming these, and these are becoming these at the same rate. And so the concentration of these four things stop changing. If I take measurements of the concentration of those things, they will no longer change. But on the atomic or molecular level, they're constantly bouncing back and forth. One instant, we could have a molecule as A, and the next instant, it's C. But when it became C, one of the C's became A at the same time. So you have opposite reactions happening at the same rate, so the concentration stops changing. So here's an example of changing our concentration, the shifting our equilibrium. We have this equilibrium. Silver iodide is in equilibrium with silver ion and iodine ion. So essentially you're putting that in water and it's dissolving. If we add, I'm oh sorry, if we remove silver ion by adding sodium hydroxide. If you add sodium hydroxide, that's going to cause a double replacement reaction in the silver hydroxide is going to sink. You're going to it's going to form a precipitate and you're going to pull the silver ion out of the reaction. So simplifying it and just thinking, if I remove that, Will the equilibrium shift left or shift right? How many say left? Wait, can you say the question? If I remove some of that, will the reaction shift right or will the reaction shift left? How many say left? How many say right? Why will it shift to the right? 